From sex punk cult to post glam kitsch, Adam and the ants. I first saw the ants at the marquee early in 78. I was 17. I'd been banned from going to gigs before that due to my age. That was my dad's doing. And I still had a 12 midnight curfew. Still, as the marquee closed at 11, it gave me and my two punky cohorts enough time to bunk the train home. If I was late, the door might be bolted, so I'd have to find a place, the bus station or behind an office block, etc., somewhere to sleep, which was kind of counterintuitive to my dad's real purpose, I thought. Anyway, the ants were great, and Adam a true punk star. He had that kind of charisma one really gets to see in its formative state. The marquee held, what, two to four hundred people, and it was almost full. Much of the Ants audience, the followers, were youngish like us, second generation punk rockers, too young to have seen the Pistols or the Clash when they started out. I guess we were looking for our own next wave, and the Ants fitted the bill nicely. In those days, Adam wore a lot of leather, some bondage and mascara. The music had a different edge. It was fetishistic, sexually warped and alienated. There was no hint of social commentary. Often the songs would begin slowly and build to speeding, wait a minute, electric assaults on the eardrums. All this resulted in driving the fans nuts. It would get pretty violent down the front as the dancing became more and more disco-ordinated and people started lashing out. I got a black eye down there once, but I went back in anyway. Jordan, the early ants manager, would come on in a fairy dress with a little wand and scream her way through a number. I think it was called Lou. God knows what it was about. Jordan was a punk legend, worked at McLaren and Westwood's famous shop Sex, which was then called Seditionaries, in the King's Road. I ventured in there only once. It was a small, rather pokey hole, and Jordan's appearance was both blasé and intimidating at the same time. So, we had our star. We had him all to ourselves as the ants trawled round and round every little pub and club venue in London and beyond. We sweated and we danced, we pogoed and we fought above and beyond the call of duty. The music press hated the ants. They called them camp and tepid. But that was great because we knew better and it stopped the ants getting too big and thus beyond our reach. Just as lots of the original punk bands had become, Many of the original punks were also scornful of the second wave, labelling them as mere unoriginal copiers and too uniform. But hadn't these bands tried to reach out? Hadn't they instigated a movement of sorts? And wasn't it us, the kids, who had bought their records and through that helped them attain their dizzying heights? Punk really died the moment the Clash signed the CBS. The Pistols chased the money. So who gave a shit when they criticised the monster they'd created? But anyway, Adam had been around at the start. It had just taken him a bit longer to get his unique style together. Punk had a hierarchy, and in a way it still does. They don't care, but mess with their status and the knives will come out. So what? Finally, the Ants released a single, Young Parisians, a song I don't even remember them ever playing live, though I guess they did. No matter how hard I tried to like it, I couldn't. Camp and Tepid came to mind. Maybe that was the point. Still, it showed Adam wasn't pandering to his following. The second single, Xerox, was more like it, and the eventual first album, Dirk Wears White Socks, was very innovative and worked well, at least in terms of keeping us all truly baffled. I learned the Futurist Manifesto from that record. Adam was one of those art punks. They played their first gig at St Martin's School of Art. 
Just as the pistols had before them is a college I also have an association with, more's the pity. Then, at some point, the hard gigging ants disappeared from view. I didn't know what was going on, probably because I was swallowing downers like there was no tomorrow. There nearly wasn't a tomorrow. Then I saw they were playing the electric ballroom in Camden. I went along with a mate. We'd inherited a handful of tunnel, a heavy barbiturate, some of which we consumed before the gig. My mate was so out of his face by the time we got to the front of the queue, the bouncers wouldn't let him in. I don't know how I managed, but I did make it in myself. I found some friends at the bar, ordered two pints and proceeded to drop both on the floor. All I can remember after that was that when the ants came on, they were not the ants. Something surreal had happened. The lineup had changed. Only Adam himself was left. Where were his ants? Two drummers doing Burundi-style licks and Adam all made up like the glam ghost of a red Indian. It sounded okay, but it wasn't as good. Very gimmicky. Later, I learned Adam had gotten Malcolm McLaren involved. I think he thought he had gone as far as he could with the sex punk cult thing, even selling out the Lyceum to 2,000 eager fans wasn't enough. So, McLaren had performed his kiss of life, kiss of death magic on Adam before fucking off with Adam's band to form Bow Wow Wow. McLaren was a strange character, comically sublime in my book. Adam and the Ants then released a couple of low chart making singles and suddenly they were on top of the pops doing their post glam kitsch thing and Adam became the biggest pop star in the UK for 15 minutes or was it five? The gimmick like the makeup wore off and Adam despite a few acting roles here and there became a has-been. Sometime in the 90s, he hit the headlines once again, only because he'd responded to some ecklers while walking past the bar by chucking a chair through the window. Came out, he'd long suffered from depression and had trouble dealing with his head. He looked old and faded. It was hard to reconcile that with how young, good-looking and vibrant he'd once been. I recalled the time when I actually got backstage with the ants at the marquee. A girl I knew was groupying with them, or trying to. It was after the gig. Adam was pacing about the stage in a huff. You see my leather jacket? He asked me, scowling. No, sorry Adam, I haven't, I replied. He tutted and walked off mumbling. Who nicked my fucking jacket? Oh, those were the days. I wonder if he kept his cult status and not gone for fame and glory. He might just have held it together and become anyway more of a legend than is remembered today. I come across people who only know Adam and the Ants for that brief glam pop stage, but there was much more about them than that. <laughs>